I was caught in the center of an earthquake, a tsunami, and a volcano explosion in Mindanao. This is my survival story. Twelve years ago, I woke up to my bed rattling uncontrollably, and seconds later I heard a window smash. I quickly got out of bed and saw large amounts of water rushing into my home. Given that I was living in a small village in Mindanao, I knew the protocols for earthquakes and tsunamis. By the time I got to the door, the water was at my thighs and rising, and a shard of broken glass had flung at my face and lodged into my cheek. I was pouring red and used every ounce of my strength to open the door. I yanked the glass shard out, but just as luck would have it, a tiny wave catapulted a broken tree branch and hit me directly in the chest. I fell backwards and became submerged under the water. I flailed around but thankfully managed to get my head back above. The water was now at my waist, and I began swimming to reach higher ground. I somehow evaded harmful objects, but then I heard a deafening crash coming from behind. I turned around and saw a massive wave engulf my straw house and watched as the roof completely collapsed in on itself. I felt devastated watching my home be destroyed, but I had to keep going. I kept swimming trying to reach safety, and as I swam, something caught my eye. It was a large, dark shape moving through the water ahead of me. At first, I thought it was just a log or debris, but then it turned and I saw its eyes. My blood ran cold. It was a crocodile. A freaking crocodile was right in the middle of my street. I didn't think. I just swam. I pushed myself harder than I ever had before. My muscles were burning, and my lungs were screaming for air. But the crocodile was gaining on me, and I knew there was no way I could outrun it in the water. I could feel it getting closer, and I honestly thought that was it. I was about to die. But then, out of nowhere, a boat appeared. I swear it was like some kind of divine intervention. This guy on the boat, who looked just as panicked as I felt, threw me a rope and pulled me aboard just in time. I collapsed onto the deck, my heart pounding so hard I thought it might burst. I don't think I've ever been so scared in my life. I was shaking all over, but I managed to thank the guy who saved me. When I finally caught my breath, I asked him if he knew the full scale of the impact on. He shook his head. No idea, but it's happening all over town. The guy told me he'd been rescuing people all morning, picking them up from rooftops, pulling them out of cars, you name it. He asked if I wanted to help, and honestly I didn't know what else to do. It's not like I had anywhere else to go, so that's what we did. We spent the next few hours pulling people out of the water and getting them to safety. It was pure chaos. Some people were injured, some were in shock, and and others were just trying to process what was happening. I can't even begin to describe the fear and confusion that went on. It was like everyone was in survival mode. While we were working, I noticed the guy kept checking his phone, like, obsessively. At first I thought maybe he was trying to get a signal or check for updates, but then I realized it was something more. When I asked him about it, he told me he was waiting for a call from his wife. She'd gone missing during the flood, and he was terrified something had happened to her. My heart broke for him. Here he was, risking his life to save strangers while the person he loved most was out there somewhere in potential danger. I could see the worry on his face and it made me want to help him even more. I told him we'd find her, and that became our mission. We started searching and asking everyone we rescued if they'd seen her. I could see the hope flicker in his eyes every time someone paused to think, and the crushing disappointment when they shook their heads. It was like a roller coaster of emotions, and I was right there with him, feeling every twist and turn, until one of the women said they'd seen someone that fit the description of his wife. He asked if she was wearing a red jacket, long brown curly hair, a brown purse, and a gold necklace. The woman we rescued paused and tried to recall every detail. She then said they found her. The guy's face brightened, and without wasting a second, he turned the boat and headed toward the direction this woman gave us. We hurried through the debris, and eventually there was indeed a woman who fit the description perfectly. Red jacket, brown curly hair, gold necklace, and a small bag. He rushed forward, calling out her name. But as she turned around to face us, his smile fell. The woman looked confused, and then I realized what had happened. She wasn't his wife. She had all the details, but her face was different. The guy's hope shattered in that instant. He apologized to the woman, who seemed just as shaken, and then turned back to me and carried on saving others in hopes of finding his wife. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, we found a group of people huddled on top of a building. Among them was his wife. She was injured, but alive. Her left leg had a deep wound, and she looked like like she could barely stand. I don't think I'll ever forget the look on his face when he saw her. It was like every ounce of fear and worry melted away. He ran to her, and they held each other like they'd never let go. We loaded everyone onto the boat and headed to a shelter on higher ground. By this point, I was beyond exhausted. My body felt like it had been put through the ringer, and my mind was in shambles. But even though I was tired, I couldn't stop until I knew my own family was safe. The whole time, I'd been pushing thoughts of them to
to the back of my mind and tried to focus on the task at hand. But now, with the immediate danger behind me, the fear hit me in full force. What if they hadn't made it? The thought was too much to bear. When we got to the shelter, I practically sprinted inside, searching for them. I must have checked every room a dozen times. I felt my heart sinking lower with each empty room I entered. And then, just when I was about to lose hope, I saw them. My husband and my kids were all there, safe and sound, huddled together in a corner of the room. I ran to them, and we collapsed into each other's arms. I don't think I'd ever felt such overwhelming relief in my life. I held them so tight, afraid that if I let go, they might disappear. We stayed like that for a long time, but just when I thought the worst was over, the ground beneath us shook. There was this deep, rumbling sound, followed by a deafening explosion. Everyone in the shelter froze. We ran outside to see what had happened, and my heart sank all over again. In the distance, we could see a massive fire spreading through the village. Flames were shooting into the sky, and thick black smoke was billowing out, covering up the sun. The explosion had come from somewhere close, and it was spreading fast. I knew we couldn't just stand there and watch as the fire consumed everything. The man who had saved me earlier grabbed my arm and said, We have to help. There are still people out there. And he was right. Even though every fiber of my being wanted to stay with my family, keep them safe, and never let them out of my sight again, I knew we couldn't just sit by while others were in danger. So, we grabbed whatever supplies we could from the shelter, blankets, first aid kits, and anything that might be useful, and headed back out into the chaos. Luckily for us, the Tesnuami had stopped hitting us, but there was still water everywhere and the streets were a war zone. The fire was now our main concern, and it spread quickly. The heat was so intense that it felt like my skin was burning, but we pushed on. We were determined to help as many people as we could. We worked tirelessly, pulling people from burning buildings, carrying them to safety, and doing whatever we could to keep the fire from spreading. It was exhausting, both physically and mentally. Every time we thought we had things under control, another fire would spring up, or a building would collapse, forcing us to start all over again. And the whole time, there was this constant fear that my family was still in danger, that at any moment the fire could reach the shelter and I wouldn't be there to protect them. But I tried to shake that thought out of my head. At one point, we came across a group of firefighters who were trying to contain the blaze. They were exhausted, covered in soot and sweat, but they were still fighting with everything they had. We joined them, helped to direct people away from the danger zones, and worked to keep the fire from spreading to the areas with a lot of people. But it wasn't enough. The fire was too big. We were losing ground and fast. And then, just when it seemed like all hope was lost, one of the firefighters came up with a plan. He told us all that the fires weren't because of a volcano, but a huge gas leak that resulted because of the earthquake and tsunami. The gas main that had caused the explosion was still active, pumping fuel into the fire. If we could find a way to shut it off, we might be able to stop the fire from spreading any further. It was a long shot, but it was the only shot we had. So, the guy with the boat and I, along with a few of the firefighters, set off to find the gas main. The firefighters led the way while the guy and I followed closely. We had to navigate through some of the worst hit areas, dodging flames, debris, and the threat of collapsing buildings. I honestly wasn't sure if we'd make it out alive. We scanned the area for any sign of the gas main. We turned a corner and found ourselves in what used to be a busy intersection that looked like a flooded wasteland. The firefighters jumped in the water and started searching through, and then one of them shouted for us to come over. We rushed over to find a firefighter diving underneath the water to a large, industrial-looking valve. This was the gas main. It was a massive tangle of thick pipes that snaked through the ground, damaged and leaking in places. The sight sent a shiver down my spine. This was the source of the fire. Without wasting a second, the firefighters got to work, using every tool to access the valve. The man and I helped where we could, lifting broken pieces of concrete and twisted metal. My hands formed blisters. Finally, the debris was cleared enough for the firefighters to reach the valve. They signaled for us to step back as they prepared to turn it off. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched, praying that it would work. One of the firefighters took a deep breath and said his prayers, then dived under. There was a moment of tense silence as he was under, and we could see his body's faint outline going to work. Two full minutes later, he was still underwater, and that's when the hiss of escaping gas slowed, then stopped altogether. The line was shut off. We did it, he said. We actually did it. The firefighters nodded, but their expressions remained serious. Before we could celebrate, one said that the immediate threat was gone, but there was still a lot of work to do. We needed to make sure the area was secure and help the remaining survivors. I nodded, and we went on. The village was still in ruins, but for now, we had won a small victory. The fires had finally been extinguished. The waters had slowly slowly started to recede, and the gas was gone. Entire blocks were reduced to ashes, homes were destroyed, and the streets were littered with debris. It looked like a scene from a post-apocalyptic movie. We were all exhausted. We had been through hell and back, and it showed. Our clothes were worn out, our faces were smeared with soot, and our bodies were covered in cuts and bruises. But despite all that, there was this overwhelming sense of relief. We had made it through the worst of it and saved lives. That was what mattered. As we sat on what was left of a hill overlooking the city, there was a moment of silence. But then the guy I was with 
Swift turned to me, and with a tired smile, he said, We did it. I couldn't help but smile back, even though my heart was still heavy from all the lost homes around us. At that moment, I realized that even though we had lost so much, we still had each other. That's when it struck me. I had gone on an entire mission with this guy and didn't know his name. I told him Miranda was mine, and he revealed that his was Tom. In the days that followed, the village began to pick up the pieces. The damage was extensive, and it was clear that it would take years to fully rebuild. But the community came together in a way I had never seen before. People who had lost everything found comfort in each other, and those who still had something to give, gave it freely. As for me, I knew I couldn't leave. This place, as broken as it was, had become my home. I couldn't turn my back on it now, not after everything we had been through. So, I decided to stay and help with the recovery efforts. Tom stayed too, and we became close friends, working side by side to bring the city back to life. 